This is Nicholas Moran, the Chieftain, and we are at Arsenal Lund in Sweden. We've been going around borrowing Stefan Carlsson's tanks for a couple of days doing some video shooting. So we thought we'd take advantage of the opportunity to get a little bit more background on the Swedish tanks in general. So I guess the first question is, I've always thought Sweden would be more of an infantry-centric country. What is the role of the tank in Swedish doctrine? Well, from, from the beginning, there was uh, a strong argument against tanks. Uh, but we got the tanks, the 10 that we bought in 1921, and didn't have to use them against the communists. So the, the army just got them, uh, test them, try what they can be used for. And they realized, well, they were per perhaps not that bad. So they did continue with it. Uh, and uh, if you compare to Norway, we had uh, strongs of uh, 16 tanks and 48 light tanks in 1939 compared to Norway, they had one. So we, we did take steps um, against this. Uh, uh, and uh, the infantry, well, they didn't really like the idea of tanks, but they realized, they, well, they are there and we we're going to use them for at least something. So you said Norway had one tank and of course we saw what happened to Norway. Uh, I presume that people in Sweden were looking that direction and going, hmm. I think so, yeah. And what we learned during the Second World War, what happened out there, we realized that we need tanks because what happened during the Second World War and we need an air force. So that's why we developed the fourth biggest air force in the world during the 1960s and we also had 650 tanks in total uh, during the 1960s so we we looked at what happened out there and tried to do what we could to keep up in, in that strength were the tanks organized in independent tank units or would they also be integrated with the infantry divisions um, we didn't have that uh, system with the division, so, uh, but we had a similar, so we had uh, br uh, brigades, uh, but that they were independent uh, armored brigades or infantry brigades, but they could be mixed together if needed to. So you could have, uh, for instance, one armored brigade and two infantry brigades mixed together or vice versa, depending on uh, what the threat which should look like. Were, were the tank units supposed to be more of a, a strong defensive system or were they more for let the infantry break them and then the tanks will exploit? Um, the tank were more the attack unit uh, against um, a strong enemy and the infantry should go, go around and, and um, use the terrain that was not that suitable for, uh, for tank units because we have not that much terrain in Sweden which, which is really suitable for, for tank units with open fields. So mo most of the country is uh, wooden or well, uh, partly wooden areas. So a lot of these this tanks, so you look at the M42, which was designed to be really small so it would be light for the infrastructure. And you know, even the tank behind can swim. When did that logistical constraint go away? I mean, now we're looking at 65-ton leopards. So there was a time when you had to be very limited as to the technology you could use. Yeah, the, these um, thoughts about being able to swim came uh, during the 1950s or early 60s. And we realized that we need to be able to move around within the country without being... Um, having the bridges or, or other units to, to support. So that was something that we, we need to get across um, lakes or rivers uh, within the unit and not be dependent on, on other resources. Um, and of course, um, the weight of the tank set its limits for uh, bridges, uh, be able to swim, uh, railroads, etc. Sweden is known now in the armaments industry for before as Hangland's uh, British Aerospace have bought out some of them, Saab, uh, the Air Force. Ha has Sweden always had a history of weaponry or is this something that has really only happened you know, in the mechanized era? 
Now we have had a um, um, weapons industry for a long time with uh, uh, guns like Bofors and um, of course um, swords and things like that earlier in days. But we also had quite early um, motor in industry with cars and lorries from the beginning, um, trains, um, ship industry. And that has developed so we have had uh, the possibility to be built almost everything within the country with we bought, built our own tanks, uh, aircrafts, um, battleships, submarines, um, weapon systems, um, missiles, uh, radio communication. So um, we didn't really need to buy that much from abroad. We have bought uh, a few uh, aircraft engines and, and parts of the technology, but most of it we could develop within the country. And we also um, started the project uh, to develop our own nuclear weapons, but that was cancelled. Sweden has built a lot of its own designs for everything, but every now and then you will buy something from somebody else, like Centurion, like Leopard 2. Why are these outliers happening? Was it just Sweden couldn't make it, or was there something else going on? I would say that these are coincidence that it just happened. Um, we wanted a new tank uh, in the 1950s and um, we had tested and realized we need or we could have a heavy tank. We had tested the, the, the Panther and the Churchill and they were quite reliable in, in Sweden and we tried to buy Centurions but no they wouldn't let us so we then started to de develop our own tank and then all of a sudden Britain wanted money so they could sell us tanks all of a sudden so of course we bought the Centurions and in the Leopard 2 case we looked for a new tank and there was the possibility to buy old uh, well, used Leopard 2 from, from uh, Germany so uh, some cases there was an opportunity that just came up uh, instead of using a lot of money to develop and perhaps uh, slow the process uh, instead of getting it now and not in 15 years time. When Sweden does design its own equipment it tends to do things a bit differently. Yeah. Why is the Swedish design so different to anybody else's? Um, tricky question. Um, it's not always when we design it by ourselves. It's also the same when we're buying something from another country. Like uh, we have bought a lot of things. We want it the Swedish way and we wouldn't want to add this and we want to remove that. And that makes things uh, increasing cost. And of course it takes more time. And we bought a helicopter together with uh, a few different countries. Um, they have their helicopter. We don't because it's not developed, de delivered yet because we wanted it different from the others. So uh, it's not all, all, only when we design our own strange things, but uh, for some reason we want it a bit different. Uh, we're not, not satisfied with what is out there on the shelf, so we, uh, we want to add something. Let's move on and talk about the museum uh, right quick. This is a new museum. Yeah. How old? We opened in 2011, so this is five years. Okay. And why is the army collection here? That's also a coincidence. Um, when the Swedish army reduced enormously in the early 2000s, they realized we have to do something about it to save things and the army museum and the Swedish army, uh, well they asked how to do this and uh, how could we preserve parts of the history and in Strängnäs there was a foundation who said we can do it, give us enough resources and we can build you a museum because the government didn't want to have it run by themselves, they wanted a cooperation with someone. Uh, and uh, there it was. So we, we moved 
the old tank museum from the former local locations, uh, 300 kilometers down south, and in three weeks it was up here. The tanks are owned by the government still? Yeah. Do they put restrictions on what you can do with them? Y yeah, partly. We have a cooperation, uh, what we can do and what we cannot do. Uh, and that's uh, so far uh, a very good cooperation. So we're, we have uh, agreed on, on a certain level, but they want the collection to be shown to the public. Uh, and if we need to drive them around, well, we have to do it uh, and not just uh, keeping them standing. Uh, in the, in the dark, in the dust. So do you have like a tank fest for Sweden? Uh, yes, we have. Um, we call it uh, a tank day. Uh, and it's uh, every year and we take uh, five, ten different vehicles out to move around and, and show to, to the public. Are you planning on expanding a bit more or is this it? Um, if we could get some more money, we will expand uh, because we have a lot in the storage uh, that we would like to show and we would also like to, to be able to show it a bit different and to have uh, uh, the change of uh, exhibition and uh, have themes uh, uh, which year we could have this and next year we so could have that. Yeah, ro yeah. Rotating and di different um, angles from, from things. and. We, we uh, listen to, to the audience what they want or what they would like to see and uh, we're trying to fulfill their expectations. Okay, three, okay, three more questions and, we'll, and I'll let you go. Question one, what is your impression as a Swedish person uh, interested in tanks of the American and British tank industries and their doctrine and how they've worked? I think uh, the British industry is um, very interesting because um, they have um, interesting ideas. Uh, the American industry, I'm impressed by the size of it and how they managed to just spit out tanks after tank after tank and enormous resources. Uh, so it's uh, incredible how they managed to do it. And for the British, uh, some people say the British tanks, they were crap. Yeah, but they did well during the Second World War, and they still do. So um, I'm impressed. Okay, so as a Swedish person, what do you think British and Americans think of Swedish industry, Swedish tanks? What, what misconceptions would you like to change? Um, most people perhaps don't know about the Swedish tank industry, except for the S-tank. Uh, but we have built our own tank since 1931. Uh, but I don't think that people know about that. Fair enough. And your last question. Have you seen any influence of World of Tanks on the knowledge or interest of the Swedish population in general in tanks? Yes, we have. Um, people know about World of Tanks and um, often they say, well, yeah, we're I've read about that, or I saw that through World of Tanks. So I think the game has gained the interest among people that are a bit older. And we have realized the, the people that really are keen to the, to the game in Sweden, they are from 30 years to 50 years old. And they are very interested in the history, the technology, and all the details. So I think you are doing a very good job there.